Good afternoon. I'm Sherry Kendall, and we're here today with the Hometown Salutes. I have a very special guest today, and his name is Herschel Hanafi. Welcome, Herschel. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start at the beginning about, with your story here. Um, you were in the Army. Right. And you went yeah. in the Army in what years? 50. 1952? Yes. To 1955, correct? Right. Okay, so why don't you tell us how you, you were not drafted, you actually enlisted, right. correct? Right. So why don't you tell us that story? Uh, oh, I don't know where to start. Okay, I was eight years old, and me, before I knew anything or could re remember back past that, and... Uh, uh, I lived with two old men, it was supposed to be my uncles, and uh, uh, worked every day and did all that good stuff, you know. And uh, went to a one-room country schoolhouse with one teacher and 26 kids from the first grade to the 12th. Oh, wow. I didn't learn any, or to the 8th. I didn't learn anything. I was there and got diphtheria, got quarantined in, and missed almost a whole year of school. That put me here behind. And uh, a car picked us up, nine of us. A lady drove a bus, but it was a car. We'd all pile in there and went to, and we had a stove in the middle, of, just like oh, years ago. There was a stove in the middle of the room, and we had a woodshed, we had a fire, had a water bucket, in the back of the school on a table, had a dipper in it, and everybody drank out of the same. <laughs> Wouldn't do that today, no. of course. We all drank out of the same bucket, you know. And uh, but teacher didn't have time for all of us, you know. She'd tell us to read or do something, and she'd, but we'd watch what the other kids were doing and not didn't, you know, pay attention enough. Uh, and then I got sick right in the middle of the year and missed almost a whole year. Got quarantined in with diphtheria, supposedly. And a health officer came and put a big sign on the door. And oh, wow. Boy, what a long winter that oh, was. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah, oh. So then your senior year in high school, you saved money for a car? Oh, I uh, ran off from home okay. when, with, when I lived with that old man. I ran away. Uh, I, took a, I put a uh, T-shirt and some socks and maybe an extra pair of pants in a in a brown paper bag. And this farmer in Frank, in Fayette County needed somebody to work for him. And uh, I called, got hold of him, and he said, I'll come out and pick you up. I said, no, you pull out 121 to where it runs into 52, and I'll be standing on the corner because I ran off from home. I put everything I owned in a brown paper bag. <laughs> A grocery sack, and I walked down there, and he picked me up and took me back to his farm, which the best thing that ever happened to me. They were wonderful people, and I milked twelve, moved milk cows, and he farmed, and I learned a lot, and uh, it was great. Had food, place sleep, and it turned out one of the best things I ever did. Ah. And twenty-five dollars, uh, fifth no, let's see, fifteen dollars a week, room and board. Fifteen dollars a week, room yeah. and board. And, uh, oh my yeah, gosh! That, that's what I, uh, this is, and this was for a whole summer, you know. Okay. And I enjoyed it and uh, learned a lot, and it, it was. I'm glad I did it. So then, and you then even when I got out of service, I had nowhere to stay. You know, I came home and nobody. And some reason or other, I contacted him or saw him. Hey, come and come and. Uh, Live with us, Aww. and you can help me on weekends and pay you. You know, you can pay or that'll pay your way. I worked out of state, and uh, so I would uh, worked over high at a Tom Energy plant, and I stayed with them until I got married. You know, and it worked out really great. Okay. And so your senior year, you raised enough money to buy a car. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, back then you buy a car fifty bucks. Right. <laughs> yes, I bought a Mercury, and the first month of school or the first right off the bat I had a wreck right in front of the schoolhouse I oh hit a, my gosh the gas feed stuck to the floor and I hit a tree and it it told the car 
The next day, I went in service. They have no money in. You know, I blew everything right there, and I went. You enlisted in the well, service. I enlisted the army and went to Richmond. A guy took me to Richmond, and they told me you uh, go to Franklin County Sheriff's Office and get a clearance, and say that you, you're not wanted for something, and you'd be back here in the morning, and we'll put you on a train. And that's where it, that's where I got started. Wow! So you enlisted into the army. And oh. for 16 weeks, you were in basic training? They sent me to Fort Knox. Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when the basic training was over, you were put on a ship. Is that right? Right. So is that this one, right? Yes. The USS, the U.S. Naval CC Blue. Yeah, right. Right. And so you went straight from there, there to, to Japan. Tokyo, J Tokyo, Japan. You got your rifle. They issued me a rifle and let us zero it in. Out on a mountainside, no Mount Rainier, or yeah. not, no Mount Fujiyama, and uh, next day we got on a ship, back on the ship, and went around to Incheon, Korea, uh, out in the water. The ship they didn't have any docks. We climbed over the side on ropes with my rifle on my back and got on a little landing. Yeah, that's what we call them, little landing jobs, and went ashore. Of course, you didn't get all the way to shore your feet got wet, but, <laughs> and they put us on deuce and a half trucks. It's just piled in there, and off we went, right up through the middle of Korea. Korea had a, when well, they had the peace talks at Panmunjong, a road ran from the south of Korea to the north, up the center, and that was a no-fire zone. Nobody... So that was the Freedom Road? That was Freedom Road. Okay. And a corridor on each side so far would not shoot in it or out of it. So they took us right up through there. So and that's pretty much this map, correct? Uh, that's uh, that's the road right here. This is a road. Okay. It's came in there, Freedom Road or whatever. And uh, they put us on there and we slept on there that night. We slept in them trucks. And as it went north, they kept dropping guys out. Uh, dropping them off, and wound up. We got up to the main line of resistance. Is the there's only three of us left on truck, uh, so we went as far as you could go. So you were at the top of the uh, yes, we're up to, up to the dividing line, and they uh, there's sort of old sergeant out there hollering. Come on, you dummies, you know, and three of us, we followed him. Went up an old creek bed through rocks, like, like a Jeep road, a back road. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he took us up to where we was going uh, to the mountain. And you go with me and you go. Somebody was there waiting on us, taking us to our position of where we would be. Yeah. And they took me in up the left of top of the mountain and said, this is your bunker right there. This is your gun position, right in a curve of sandbags. And right up next to it was a 50 caliber machine gun. And uh, there's a bunker there. And he said, you'll have to make you somewhere to sleep in there. I took a bunch of comma wire, telephone wire, and wired up a thing in there and put uh, sea ration boxes, cardboard boxes on the wire mm -hmm. up off the ground because water would get in there. Keep your boots. The only thing you took off to go to bed to lay down was your boots. You and, slept uh, in your, your uniform, yeah, and, that's you just, it. and you only slept in the daytime. You didn't. Uh, you worked at night. Worked at nights and slept in the daytime. So barbed yeah. wire was completely around. Oh, yeah, concertina wire around it, all the way around the top of the mountain. Plus behind and behind it, where we were, was trench. Dug in the ground as deep as you could dig on kind of rock, and then it was sandbagged up. And the sandbags were laid in a slant so shells couldn't drop right straight in, you know. And uh, and they was all the way around. You, as you can see, they're all the way around that. It was wow. barbed wire and a trench. And gun positions, there's a slot for a tank, there's a slot for that uh, a quad 50, and then we had mortars at, back behind us that shot. You know, 60s and 81 millimeter mortars, they could fire from the back. And the, the company commander was behind us in the, on the backside of the hill. And those Marines were right 
on the backside of the hill. Mm. You call them when you need them, and they'd go to a slot cut out for them. Wow. And uh, look at that. That's a trench, and look what a mess. <laughs> Sandbags everywhere. And that's you in the uniform, and, correct? With yeah, that's me with the rifle and everything. And the, yeah. And we had wire tied with grenades hanging on them along the trench line in case you need to throw water or whatever. And so it, through the it, Army, you received... A CIB badge, right? The right. Combat Infantry that, Badge. If, if and that you, is... If you have that one, it tells the story. You have to be 60 or three months or something online, and you got to be in... On the front line. On the front line. you combat. got... That tells you wow. everything. Combat, everybody. They don't just get that. you got to be there. And, and you earn that. You're... <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's scary. So eating, you were eating rations. And oh, they come along every night. So and, what's this? Uh, that's a Marine gave me eggs. So you were friends with the Marines? Uh, one. One, of, <laughs> one Marine. Me, and <laughs> somehow or the other, how, we'll never know this day, how they got real eggs. Because there was no eggs in Korea or no, no thing. And they came from Indiana, like I told you. They came from Silver Lake, Indiana. And we took a can lid and a pair of pliers and put it over a heater and yeah, we fried them and we ate them, see, like that. And it, it was, it, it, <laughs> it funny. was different. Oh, yeah. And so who is this with that's, you? Uh, Levi Wallace. He was from England. He was a forward observer. He called in artillery. He had a place up on top of the mountain on the front where he could see where the shells were hitting and he'd call in a, f to, for a fire, they'd fire around and see how close they came to the asthma or whatever he gave them. And he'd either say up or back. And the next one he would say, uh, huh. fire three for effect. And they'd hit right on top of those guys, you know. Wow. And he was a great person. So why don't you tell us a little bit about May 28th? What year is that? Oh, May 28th, 2000? Uh, or yes. 1950. Well, the war was getting close to an end, or they thought we were going to agree on something, and that was the highest ground within miles where we were, mm -hmm. and they wanted that really, really bad. So on night May 28th, they hit us with everything they had except artillery because of Freedom Road. They afraid they'd, you know, they fired into that, but they came in waves to try to do it, and we held them off. I don't know. <laughs> just they know. I so mean, that it, morning when the sun came oh, up, it was just morning. a yeah. battle zone. Uh, I mean. They gave up during the night about three or four hours. They knew that they wouldn't get anywhere. And I said, uh, I don't They moved on. I moved up, went side of the go someplace else. And the next morning we got up. Uh, it was wow. chaos. You wouldn't believe it. it was people, you know, dead people and... And we had we had some guys hit, you know, and stuff with shrapnel and all that stuff. But uh, and there was some of their wounded out there in the wire, got in the Constantine wire and wanting out, wanting help, and waving a white little white flag, you know. And uh, somebody had to go out, but nobody wanted to go. I went. You I did go. I volunteered to go out, and we brought some of them in. They were wounded and everything else, and uh, took them down there. But at Freedom Road, where they had a place for it and and there's somebody come and got them and but it was wow uh, it was something, chaos something you'll never forget oh, i mean no. yeah, i just can't even I imagine could hear artillery come over my head from behind me <laughs> making a hissing sound and see it hit out in front of us and we sit there with our Golly. guns you know anything what we did mostly fired at well you see a flash and you couldn't see those people in the dark but you could see you know we we spray them with a thirty caliber, you know, and just it was different. And then uh, there's a lot of judge. the the tank commander went to the CP right quick when they when the attack started, mm -hmm. and the guys went on up in the tank and got in their slot, and they were firing away. And of course, the enemy was rounds were ricocheting off. They had army in the trenches on both sides of them. They shot out all the lights on the tanks. So the enemy did and all this. And he came up there, came up. They was already, and they had the tank locked down, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't let him in. 
he, 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 they could hear somebody tapping, but they wouldn't know where in the world they're going to open that hatch and let him get in. But they didn't know it might be the enemy. Yeah. He had to crawl underneath the tank and stay in there till it, till oh, it was over. Oh my gosh! Oh, and when the enemy left or gave up, <laughs> he come crawl out of under there, and those guys were those Marines had the tank all open and had the army on both sides in their trenches, you know, and they were singing the. <laughs> Uh, Marine anthem. Oh, oh, oh singing up. So you know, it 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 was different. Wow. Oh. Huh. So then you um, got out of the service in 1955. Right, October of 55. So you came back and uh, what well, did you do at that? I had point? a job offer. They came to us in Fort Lewis, wanting employees for Boeing aircraft, and. Uh, if you will give you seven days delay in route, if you want to go home for seven days, you come back and you'll have a job at Boeing Aircraft. I had a theater and probably maybe six or seventy of us in there, and they, I signed it. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back. But we all came home. I came home for seven days, and there, you know how that went. Yeah. All the locals. Uh, I, I never. I should have. I, I didn't go back. Okay. But uh, see, we could we could have had a job there, and. Uh, uh, I went to work over in Ohio at an atomic energy plant called Fernald. They yeah. had uranium and they made slugs for reactors yeah. and all that. And so I worked there nine and a half years. But people started getting sick and things were happening to them and kind of got a little bit scared, you know. And and I, I started that. and uh, I left there and came back to Connersville. And uh, is that when you met your wife? Or you knew your wife oh, all oh, growing up, correct? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. She came to the farm when she was a little girl. And, uh, oh, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, somewhere in that area. And I'd be milking the cows for supper, you know. And, and her dad visited and mother. And I squirted her with milk and do dumb <laughs> things, you know. And it and, uh, started back way back then. And then through the years, it I went there one time after I came home, and and uh, I knew immediately that something was. You know, <laughs> she was a lot older then, see, in high school, and. and uh, so you've been married how many years? Oh, don't know. Don't, don't, oh. <laughs> a lot. Sixty, sixty, <laughs> or six. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about something that you did that was pretty special. October twentieth, two thousand eighteen. You signed up for Indy Honor Flight? Oh, yes, yes. So who signed? I had no idea, didn't want to do it, didn't want, didn't know anything. And my granddaughter, wanted a while ago, yeah. talked me into it. Aww. And it's one of the best things I ever did. I enjoyed it. They treated us like a million dollars, like we were royalty. Went up in Indianapolis, stayed all night, and went that next day and had buses, food, Anywhere you want to go, anything you want to see, we, we did. And they fed us, and it, it was a delight. Had a perfect day, took lots of pictures. Uh, so at the wall, I mean, they think that was you? Yeah. They, they, oh the camera crew came from, my granddaughter called somebody, and they came and took all angles and everything. And wow, that, wow. Well, somebody, one well, of my grandkids mm -hmm. saw it first, and... And oh, saw so that that was you? Yeah, they thought that. Well, it looks like Grandpa, you know. Okay. And uh, Yeah, that's this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was. That is really neat. But, but that honor flight, but I'd recommend that. Oh, any, anybody. Tell people to sign hope, up. I, my gotta, neighbor. I'm going to get my neighbor signed up. There you he go. He was in Vietnam and uh, got wounded and all kind of. He's, he's had a, and he's still. A little bit nervous, you know, and stuff, but uh, he's a great guy. Yeah, you, you almost now, wanted to back out, so now, aren't you glad yeah, you went on? I, now, you know, I, there were two guys that I went to school with at the country, little country school, and then in town, a boy from here in Connersville, he lived here later, went to Korea before I did, and he got frostbit, and he lost all, all of his toes, I think, on one foot. Gene Helms was his name from here in Connersville. And another one that went to the little country school that I went to, one room country schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. I got a picture of it in there for you too. Uh, he got killed, and they never found him till 
seven, probably seven years ago. They found his body and brought him back here. Uh. Yeah, his name was Buddy Sizemore, and his family sang on radio and stuff back then. Okay. And I went to school with him. But they found his body over there years later, and he was buried over Rushville because he's from down uh. in this area, you know. Okay. Uh, there's wow. a lot of things that, yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> oh. So you just you just started talking about this, right? Like you said, your kids, yeah, your I, wife yeah. don't. They I, haven't I really heard told, a lot of oh, these no, stories. No, they never. I never talked about it. I don't know. I really why well, my my son gets mad at me because I never, you know, I never told him anything about anything. You know, oh. But I was lucky. I mean, I was one of the guys that was really lucky. And, yeah, you know, survived. Like, right place at the right time. And uh, there were times you wondered, but you know, <laughs> there's a reason for everything. But Right. Uh, so is but, there a funny... But I'm, I'm really glad I did it. I'm, I, I, after, after I did it, you know, I, right. I'm glad I didn't go to the Navy or anywhere else. I wouldn't have the experiences or wouldn't, wouldn't got to do or travel like I did. And, and it wow. was it was all right, and, to get but back. When I, if I came home, if it had a year to go. See, I came home. I still had a year to go, and uh, they uh, take three years. And uh, so, what did you do then when you came they back? Me, they sent me back to Washington State, uh. Fort Lewis. I'd go out there, and that's how I got into the prison chasing and the. Uh, MP and all that stuff. They, oh, so you, cha you yeah, chased? Yeah, I had a year to go, and they didn't want to do it. Then they put me in this outfit to, to uh, 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 stockade, stockade guards and all that. And one day they said, would you would you like to chase prisoners? And, yeah, I do. Well, we got somebody in Indianapolis. <laughs> now, how, what would the chance that ever happening? I said, yeah, I'd go. And I came to Indianapolis, me and another fella. And uh, at Fort Benjamin Harrison, he was in the brig there. And so far from base, you got time off. So we had time. We both went. He lived in Chicago, and I lived in here. He went that way, and I went that way for two days. We How, had two, how'd you get there? Hitchhiked. Did you? We hitchhiked. Oh, my gosh. We, uh, <laughs> we each one got a taxi, take us from the, uh, downtown <laughs> to out to 52 South, and he went 52 North, going to Chicago. And oh, we met my. on Monday morning, Yeah, uh, come back that Monday morning in Fort Benjamin Harrison and picked up a guy, a boy named McKinney. We picked him up, handcuffed him to us and put him on, we went to Chicago on, and then trained back to, but he had to be hooked with one of us all the time. You couldn't hook him to a seat or anything. and. We went downtown, had a layover in Chicago two hours. We, we walked downtown with him, and people look at us, you know. And, and he's hooked to you? That oh, whole yeah, time? oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Handcuffed. Gosh. Oh, yeah. He's just a guy, ordinary guy. He got homesick, and, you know, and he wasn't no criminal or anything. <laughs> and on the train, we was eating, and the joke, uh, uh, a bunch of older ladies were on a, it's a real nice train, Northwest Limited. They were eating, and they kept looking at us, and one of them asked me, what happened? I said, he murdered two old ladies and, uh, you know, made a big oh, story my up. Gosh. You were like, <laughs> oh, just made it, you know, you, you ought to see that. But oh. he was just an ordinary guy. But it was good because later they sent me to uh, San Francisco to pick up a guy AWOL. And happened to be, and take, two guys went, and a guy had a brand new Oldsmobile and he was going to L.A. Instead of taking a train down, we rode down with him, went through the Redwoods and crossed the Golden Gate to Presidio. Up, and then we had time off there. He was older than me. He went his direction, and I went mine. Went downtown and got a motel, and our hotel. And <laughs> went out to Chinatown and rode the cars and oh get gosh. lost. And uh, and that turned out to be a good good trip. Stayed up. But, Presidio up on the top of, and you could see the Golden Gate and yeah. Alcatraz. And oh, yeah. You could see all that from right where I was at. And it, wow. That was really fun. So he I guess was just an ordinary guy, too. And and we went, got a ferry, went under the Oakland Bay Bridge, a double one, back out to Treasure Island, back out to get a train to come back to Fort Lewis. And wow. Just, it was, so I guess your last fun. year in service was good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was. Uh, yeah, I got to go up to Canada and. 
a, a lot of good things. <laughs> wow. And well, that is really neat. I mean, you just really have some really good stories. and Yes, that last year, if I didn't have to do that, yeah. I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm glad I did it now. Oh, yes. But wow. uh, if I just got out a year sooner or when I come back from Korea and stuff. Yeah, but I probably wouldn't have been married and uh, <laughs> all that stuff. To, <laughs> it, that that, that turned out to be great. That was the best thing that ever happened. Well, as I was doing some research, I ran um, across this poem. It was um, a Korean War Veterans Memorial in Liberty State Park, New Jersey. And I just wanted to read it. It said, we didn't do much talking. We didn't raise a fuss. But Korea really happened, so please remember us. We all just did our duty, but we didn't win or lose. A victory was denied us, but we didn't get to choose. We all roasted in the summer. In the winter, we near froze, walking back from the near with our frozen toes. Like the surf, the Chinese kept coming with their bugles in the night. We fired into their masses, praying for the morning light. All of us just had to be there, and so many of us died. But now we're all but half forgotten. No one remembered how we tried. We got fewer with the years now, and we still don't raise a fuss. But Korea really happened, so please remember us. I've got a couple of those, a couple of those poems, or something aren't in the same order. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, oh, your stories are thing. amazing. When, when we step here online, you know, in the trenches, the, like the Tokyo Rose, you probably don't know what I'm talking about there, but on the, over the backside of the hill, they would march of a night and beat on drums and play music and talk to us on loudspeakers. Come over to us, you know, and where's your girlfriend tonight, and all this, like Tokyo Rose. They'd play music and stuff, and beat with drums, and trying to get us to come over, give up, or uh -huh. come over the side of the mountain. And that was something that really was, really, too. Wow. And he, <laughs> that is something. I had a, a little plane that would come over of a night over, when it was pitch dark. Uh -huh. uh, no lights, and they called Maytag Charlie. It sounded like a war machine. He'd fly around of a night over over top of us. You were not far. You know, you'd give up your position. And he was of no things. That's in that book you're talking about. You'll see. Oh, yeah. Uh, Maytag Charlie, we called it. Didn't pay attention to him. But uh. it was just, just things, you know. Wow. Uh, That's really neat. Oh, a lot of little things that we probably forgot that we'll remember. But yeah. I'll catch well, up with you. But yeah, I've got two or three poems like that, some for Christmas and some about, you know, what happens later in life and all that. You know. Yeah. But Wow. You know. Well, your story is amazing, and I just oh, can't thank you enough. Thing. Oh, there's a lot more things, you know, little oh, things sure. that I got to see a lot. And I crossed the United States on the train about three or four times, and that was really Northwest Limited. It went through the mountains, and wow. it just was was something for Laurel. I don't know. I've never been anywhere or <laughs> done anything, you know. Uh, well, Hershel, I just want to thank you for oh, coming, and I want to thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Thank and you, thank you. It's I been mean, a pleasure. you are a hero. With you, it's uh. a, it, it, it was worth it. It's been well. a pleasure. So I'm Sherry Kendall, so join us next month for Hometown Salutes.